Okay, I hope these are not the only people that are using Azure in the UK. <laughs> um, no, good morning. Um, by the way, I'm not surprised by the amount of people that have been talking about Azure in a couple of conferences around the world, in the, in, uh, in the US, in Europe, uh, in Israel, or in France. And uh, it's quite amazing how many people are actually using Azure, but not attending conferences. Uh, I guess that Azure is simple enough to, to use so people just think, well, I'm using Azure, I don't need to learn more about it, so I won't go to a conference to learn about Azure. Um, but you'd be surprised how much things are in Azure that people actually don't know of, because it's so um, innovative that you have new stuff every two weeks, every uh, uh, three weeks, new stuff are coming out, and I don't know if you're aware, but just put on the mic. Told me to remember to open the microphone so I would also be recorded. So let's start again. No. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know if you know, but there is actually a conference uh, in the United States this week, a uh, build conference, and they're actually going to announce some new stuff about Windows Azure. It, uh, it was just published uh, um, this morning, which is uh, yesterday in the UK. Um, and they are actually going to offer new. Uh, prices, uh, uh, a new price cuts in Windows Azure Compute um, because Amazon just cut prices a couple of weeks ago. So uh, um, we'll get at some point to the billing uh, issue of uh, infrastructure as a service and platform as a service. Uh, the prices that I'm showing are um, up to date for this morning. Okay, it may be that uh, this afternoon you'll hear about price cuts of about I think it's about 20 or 30 uh, percent. So. Um, just see these numbers and imagine that they are much smaller. Okay, so uh, um, let's begin. Um, for those who um, don't know me, uh, my name is Ido, Ido Flato. I come to from Israel. This is why I have this strange accent. Okay, um, I am working uh, with Microsoft Technologies for over 17 years uh, and in Windows Azure for the last, I think, four or five years or so. I've uh, been doing a lot of work on Azure, with Azure, uh, even wrote a course for Microsoft about Windows Azure. Uh, so if you are going to take a Microsoft official course that teaches how to use Windows Azure, uh, just look for my name. Uh, it's not on the cover because it don't put also names on the cover. It's somewhere inside in the first couple of pages. Okay, so look it up and tell to the people around you, oh, I know this guy. Okay. Uh, so why are we here? We are actually here to talk about Compute strategies. Now, the slide did say compute strategies. Basically, that means infrastructure as a service versus platform as a service. Okay? Or as we call it uh, in short, at least in Hebrew, IaaS versus PaaS. Um, I don't know how they call it in the UK. Do they call it IaaS or do they have another acronym for it? Okay. So you'll learn about the Hebrew name of uh, infrastructure as a service. So we all saw uh, this slide. Uh, at least a couple of times. Who never saw this slide before? Raise your hand. Okay, so this is the familiar slide that shows you the difference between the platform as a service, software as a service, and the infrastructure as a service. The basic idea, by the way, I haven't asked, who here is actually using Windows Azure today? Okay. Um, oh, we have this side using, this side not using. Okay, so concentrate. Um, in Windows Azure, we actually have a couple of compute uh, strategies and development strategies. The first one, um, infrastructure as a service, basically means that you get the hardware and you supply everything else. Okay, so the Windows Azure uh, fabric gives you a clean virtual machine. You even decide which operating system you want to use in it. And on top of that, you install all the software, all the middleware, your application, uh, your monitoring, diagnostic tools, everything is uh, uh, your responsibility, okay? The second part, platform as a service, is actually a more robust environment where you get an operating system, a managed operating system, which means that Azure is responsible to install all the hotfixes and Windows updates. Yes, it is only Windows, it's not Linux based. Um, you get all the scalability automatically. Uh, we'll talk about this later on, just want to clarify the difference between infrastructure and platform. Uh, and basically, you just supply the application. Okay, you supply the application, Azure provides you with the machines. So you don't actually need to worry about what will happen to, the, my, to my machine if it crashes, how can I get a different machine uh, to run my application. Um, 
Software as a service basically means that you as a developer, you create the entire system. What the end user sees is a website and they get a username, the password, and then they are able to use the system. Think of Office uh, 365. Anyone using Office uh, 365? So Office uh, 365 is software as a service. It's deployed to the cloud, okay? You log into it using a username and password. That's the only part that you actually needed to do um, as an end user. You didn't need to create an Azure account. You, needed, you didn't need to deploy uh, any of the servers, any of the application. It's all already there. You just get a username and a password. Okay, that's what we call multi-tenant applications, such as CRM applications, ERP applications. Um, software as a service basically means that you don't need to do anything as an end user. You just need the username and the password. So um, most people see this slide uh, when they um, uh, want to understand the difference between infrastructure, platform, and software as a service. Um, I um, like to figure, uh, I like to see it like so. Okay, so infrastructure as a service basically means that you are building the car from the parts. Okay, Windows Azure provides you with the parts such as a virtual machine, operating system, a virtual network, subnet definition, everything is parts. You build it on your own. Um, platform as a service basically gives you the car ready, customized, whether you like it like so or whether you like it like so. Okay, depends on your own taste. Um, and software as a service basically means you get the entire package. Okay? So I hope this clarifies the difference between the three and you know now which car you want to buy. <coughs> uh, so basically when we talk about um, compute strategies, infrastructure, platform, uh, we're not talking about software as a service because software as a service is a concept of how to build software. Currently in this session we'll talk about compute strategies which is how to host your applications, the best solution for you to select. So we're talking about four different options that you have in Windows Azure on how to host your applications. So first of all, we have virtual machine. Virtual machine is what is known as infrastructure as a service. This is what Amazon uh, EC2 is all about, okay? Um, the second part, cloud services, we'll talk about that too. That is platform as a service, a full platform as a service. Uh, the third option in Windows Azure is what is known as websites. Website is also platform as a service, but it's a basic web hosting platform as a service. Um, the same concept exists in other cloud uh, providers such as uh, Rackspace, in Amazon too, uh, um, and many other uh, hosting providers. It's basically a web server where you just deploy your application to it, and the cloud environment handles all the scalability and all the rest of the things which we will talk about later on. So it's also platform as a service, but it's more specific. It's basic web hosting, okay? Lightweight web hosting, if you like. Uh, the fourth option is also platform as a service, but that is a specific version of the platform as a service. This is a service-oriented platform as a service. So basically, you get web hosting, but that web hosting is not intended for you to create um, user uh, interface applications. It's not intended for MVC applications or, or web forms applications of such sort. It is intended for creating services. Okay, hosting your services, your API, uh, HTTP API-based services in the cloud. It provides the environment, the servers. You only need to bring your own service code, and we'll see uh, exactly how to do that later on. So these are the four options that you have to host your applications in Windows Azure. And these are the four that we are going to talk about in this session to understand the difference between each of them and then to compare them to see which one suits your needs, okay? So first of all, virtual machines. By the way, feel free to um, ask questions during the session, raise your hand. Um, so I don't need you to wait to the end of the session because it's an hour and a half. You most likely forget what you wanted to ask, okay? And by the way, please stick until the end of the session. There are stickers here that you can pick later afterwards. And by the way, I don't know if you know, but um, last week it was announced that Windows Azure will now be called Microsoft Azure. Uh, so these are collectibles. <laughs> okay? You can actually sell them on eBay later if you want. <coughs> um, I, I was in India uh, on Saturday to give an Azure course, and I had about twice as many stickers 
Um, I told the same joke, and after five minutes, all the stickers were gone. So, uh, feel free to take them after the session. So basically, what is virtual machines? Virtual machine is the most basic concept of hosting. You use it in your own on-premises environment where you have VMware or such other virtualization environments. Um, you have it on Amazon in EC2. It basically means that you get uh, a CPU, a memory and a hard drive, and you build a system out of it. You decide which operating uh, system to install, whether it's Windows or something else. Yes, Azure actually supports other operating systems than Windows, okay, not a Mac. It's not a, it doesn't support a Mac OS, but it does support uh, several Linux distributions. Uh, so basically, you have the whole experience of an IT, meaning I'm virtualizing a machine, I decide how much CPU and how much <coughs> memory I want, the size of the disk, I'm attaching virtual hard drives, uh, I'm basically building the computer from scratch. But I get a persistent virtual machine that I can actually use over and over, and even if it crashes, I'm able to just start it up on a different uh, uh, physical server, and still gain all of the things that I did with that machine. All the stuff that I wrote to the hard drive still existed. We'll see exactly how it's uh, managed in a second. So storage management, everything is uh, um, already arranged for you. You create a virtual machine, you create a virtual hard drive, you can actually uh, um, create a machine with up to 16 terabytes of hard drives. Okay? In virtual machines, um, each drive uh, the maximum size is one terabyte, but you can just link them all together to one big, gigantic 16 terabyte hard drive. Anyone needs a 16 terabyte hard drive? Maybe, hopefully. We'll find something to do with it, you know, video server or some kind. Um, and virtual machine actually supports high availability. I can actually create several virtual machines and use the Windows Azure, sorry, the Microsoft Azure Fabric controller to actually load balance those machines. So uh, um, it's not like with uh, other cloud uh, hosting providers that um, you need to provide your own load balancer or use some hardware load balancer that they have. Um, you actually get a software load balancer uh, automatically in Windows Azure, but you can also uh, bring your own um, load balancer. So for example, if you need to manage the load balancer, uh, do sticky sessions and stuff like that, you can actually create a virtual machine, say a Linux virtual machine, install um, HA proxy on it and create that machine as your load balancer, okay? So you can do basically everything except maybe running um, the F5 uh, uh, big IP uh, software, uh, the load balancer on Windows Azure because it's not supported. Um, virtual machine also supports networking, so you can create virtual network, allow your virtual machine to uh, interconnect, to exchange data between them without uh, opening the ports to the internet. So the, if you have, uh, for example, a domain controller, a SQL database server VM, and an IIS VM, they can actually all uh, talk between each other, exchange data without uh, anyone from the internet seeing that connection. We have a lot of noise from outside. So let's try to close this. Maybe that will be. Is the Azure network balancing equivalent of Windows network balancing? Is yeah, uh, you're referring to the, the LNB, the yes. network load balancer. Um, NLB, the network load balancer of Windows Azure is TCP level. Uh, the, the Windows Azure load balancer is the same. Uh, it's, uh, it's what is called as a round robin uh, load balancer. Just sends each TCP connection to a different machine. Doesn't have uh, um, any of the, custom, uh, the customizable uh, options of, for example, setting uh, sticky sessions or affinity or stuff like that. Um, it's kind of just a basic load balancer, yeah. So it's kind of similar to the NLB. Uh, however, you don't have any control over that load balancer. Um, in other cloud environments, you might have control over the load balancer. In Windows Azure, the load balancer that is supplied by the platform, uh, you can't configure it in any way, okay? Uh, you can do other stuff. For example, uh, if you want to block IPs, uh, general IPs from accessing your virtual network, uh, accessing the VMs, uh, when you open ports to the internet, you can actually set access control list on those ports and deny access from all the IPs except your company's IP, okay, uh, uh, the company IP range. Um, but that's not the, the, uh, the Azure load balancer, that's the Windows Azure firewall, okay. I um, keep saying Windows Azure, I need to repeat uh, Microsoft Azure, Microsoft Azure, try to remember that. So um, you can actually have also uh, VPN connections. So for example, I can create a virtual network 
filled with virtual machines and then connect my entire organization to that virtual network and just uh, um, see that virtual network as part of my on-premises network. Um, you can set your uh, company's router to have the definitions of that virtual network and it will just be part of your enterprise network. Okay? All of these options are maintained, of course, by IT professionals. They're not meant to be maintained by developers uh, unless you're doing both uh, roles in your organization. Okay? So when we have virtual machines, basically uh, we start by creating the virtual machines from either a user <coughs> interface like the management portal or using API like from PowerShell or direct HTTP calls. Uh, we select which version of operating system we want. We have both Windows Server and Linux. We'll see which distributions in a second. We can select the size of that machine. Um, currently the maximum size is what is known as an A7 machine which is eight cores and uh, 56, 54 gigabytes of memory. Um, we will actually see in the next couple of, month, uh, of months, I hope, uh, an A8 machine, which is a 16 core uh, with, uh, I think, uh, 64 gigabit of memory. We have those in the platform as a service. They are still uh, not available in the infrastructure as a service, but they will arrive at some point. Um, there are two conferences that are happening uh, in April and in May. Um, this week we have Build, next month uh, we have TechEd in uh, the United States and during both of those events they will probably announce some new stuff about Windows Azure which they are uh, withholding up until the conference. So um, I assume that in either of those conferences they will say that they also support the A8 machines. Um, and <clears throat> afterwards we just get a virtual machine with a virtual hard drive. We can basically even load our own virtual hard drive to the Windows Azure platform and create a VM from a local server. So if you have, for example, a web server locally which you created and developed on top of it and installed all the software on top of it, you can actually just take that VHD from your local uh, on-premise environment, upload it to Windows Azure and create your virtual machine in Azure using that virtual hard drive that you had locally. Okay, so you don't need to actually install everything from scratch again. Uh, that's a good way, for example, to migrate a public hosting environment, uh, if you have uh, hosted somewhere in the UK, and just migrate it to Windows Azure by moving the VHDs to the cloud. Uh, there was a question? Is it just Windows Server or can you set up OS with other Windows versions as well? Okay, so the question was about uh, the versions and the versions are actually the next slide. Uh, so uh, in regards to Windows operating system, we have support for uh, only Windows Server versions. You can't install Windows 7 or Windows 8 on top of Windows Azure because it's mainly for servers. So you have from ranging from 2008 R2 to 2012 R2. Uh, we actually had Windows Server 2008, not the R2, uh, back, uh, back then, but it's currently uh, not supported anymore. So the minimum version that you have is 2008 R2. Uh, you actually get um, specialized VMs, special Windows VMs that already have SQL Server on them, uh, SharePoint on them. You actually uh, pay for the virtual machine plus the monthly payment for uh, uh, that product. So for example, instead of buying a SQL Server license, a, year li a yearly license, you can actually create a virtual machine that has SQL Server already in it and you pay, the, I think it's about uh, $30 uh, per month for the uh, SQL Server license. So you don't have to buy uh, licenses separately for your uh, SharePoint server, for your SQL server, uh, and pay for uh, Azure virtual machines uh, on top of it. Okay, so you have um, many versions of the operating system, including even an Oracle database on top of a Windows server. Okay, Azure is actually supporting uh, and offering Oracle databases as virtual machines. So as you can see, uh, there is no fight anymore between Oracle and SQL Server in the cloud. Just bring whatever you want to use. Uh, in regards to Linux, uh, we have uh, stuff like uh, CentOS, like Ubuntu. Um, Oracle even have their own Linux distribution. Um, there are several distributions and they are always being updated. So whenever a new release is coming out, uh, you will be able to see it in Windows Azure when you select to create a Linux virtual machine. Okay, so for example, for Ubuntu, we have four different versions which you can create. Okay, uh, as you see currently, Windows, Linux, 
no iOS. Okay, probably won't be one. Um, so when it comes to how virtual machines are actually uh, um, using hard drives, it's important to understand that virtual machines don't use the uh, uh, physical machine the, uh, um, hard drives. Okay, um, unlike uh, for example Amazon EC2, where you can get a machine with a, a physical um, SSD. In Windows Azure, the drive that you get for your operating system and the, the, extend, the, um, the um, extensible hard drives that you can just plug into your machine are actually based on the Windows Azure storage. Anyone familiar with the Windows Azure storage? Block storage, for example? Uh, Windows Azure storage is a storage environment that, has, um, that uses all the hard drives in the data center as just one huge storage environment. Um, each storage account that you create, you can use it to host up to 200 terabyte of data. Okay, so you can just upload files, you can upload uh, um, databases to Azure Storage. It's like a file server, basically. File server, but it uses HTTP to get files and to put files in that storage. So one of the files, for example, in uh, Azure Storage is a VHD file, the same VHD file that is used for your virtual hard drive. So for example, when you create a virtual machine and you get the C drive, that C drive is actually a file in block storage. It's uh, um, the IOPS, the, the input output operations per second of such a drive is not like an SSD drive. It's slower because it has uh, to cross the entire network to get to the actual content, but it's quite fast. Um, the network connection between your virtual machine and the storage is about 10 gigabits. Okay, uh, it's a special network created by Microsoft that uh, um, is very enhanced. It allows a very fast connection between those machines. Okay, and basically the best thing about storage is that it's uh, um, uh, that it's always backed up. You always have uh, three replication of your data in the data center. So every bit that you write to the hard drive, that virtual hard drive, is actually written three times in the data center. Okay? So even if one of the physical hard drive fails, that physical hard drive that hosts your uh, uh, VHD file, um, that physical hard drive will just be uh, expelled from the data center and one of the other copies will be the primary copy, will become the primary copy. So even if uh, a physical uh, hardware goes bad, there is always a backup for your data. And on top of that, Azure Storage actually also gives you geo-replication, meaning that in addition to the three copies in your data center, there are other copies in external data center. Uh, so for example, if we look at the data centers in Europe, we have uh, the West uh, Europe data center, which is in Amsterdam, the North European data center, which is in Ireland, um, every bit that you write is asynchronously copied between those data centers. So if you're hosting your virtual machine in uh, Ireland, your data is also copied to Amsterdam. Uh, it, co it is copied in the background, so there might be a delay of a few seconds to a few minutes between your original data uh, and the backup data. Uh, you can actually even uh, get read access to that backup data just to verify uh, um, the... That's a noise. Um, you can actually get read access to verify uh, the content is, is uh, there and that it was persisted. But you can actually get a, uh, what is called a, a DLP solution, a disaster recovery plan solution in case one of the data center crashes, hit by a meteor or something like that. Hopefully it won't be hit by a meteor because that means the entire population will get wasted. But uh, So basically everything that you write on that VM is backed up to about six different locations, whether it's in the data center or outside the data center. So you can be sure that the data is not lost. Okay. Now, um, when we talk about virtual machines, as I mentioned before, the basic idea is that you build everything from scratch, meaning that you get a bare bone machine, you install Windows on top of it. You actually don't need to physically install Windows. There's no next, next, next here. Okay, you get Windows already running, but if you want to uh, use that machine as an Active Directory, you need to run the Active Directory installation on top of it. If you want it to become a web server, you need to install IIS on top of it. 
if you want it to become a SQL Server database, then you need to install a SQL Server on top of it or select one of the SQL Server VMs. You need to install everything on top of it, including uh, connecting the machine to the, uh, um, to the domain, okay? uh, um, installing uh, and setting up all the user environments and that thing. So you have to build all the servers on your own. So infrastructure as a service allows you to do the same thing that you're doing on-premise, but in the cloud, but it basically requires a lot of work and a lot of IT personnel, okay? It's not the platform as a service where you can, with, uh, um, just with a click on a mouse, get 10 virtual machines running Windows and just provide them with the zip file of my application, okay? I have to build it everything from scratch, okay? It's not done in a second, it's done in a, uh, an hour, two days, a week, depends on how many virtual machines you need to create, okay? And scaling is not that easy because uh, um, if I managed to explain myself correctly and you understood me, I need to install everything. So even if I'm doing uh, um, an installation of a web server and I now want to scale it up to 10 web servers, I need to actually install all of those extra nine web servers okay, to completely have 10 web servers. So basically, yes, I can create an image of the server that I uh, created for the first time. I can install IIS on it, install an application on it, create an image of it, and then when I need to create another server, just create a virtual machine based on that image so I get the web server and my application automatically. But think of what will happen if you need to, for example, upgrade your application. You need to create a virtual machine using that image, install the new version on top of it, re-image that machine, and probably redeploy the application, the new version, to every one of your uh, servers that are, that are already running, okay? And scalability is actually not that simple because, um, again, if I want to have, for example, 10 virtual machines, I basically need to create the initial 10 virtual machines, and then, for example, if I only want two to run and eight uh, uh, to wait for a large load, I need to actually shut down eight of the machines and instruct Windows Azure to, uh, um, to uh, start them up when it needs to scale my machines. So I'll start with two machines and have eight shut down. And by the way, for those eight that are shut down, you don't pay for their CPU, but you do pay for their storage. And virtual machines, if you know, uh, can take up, up to a couple of gigabytes of data because the virtual hard drive itself is data, okay? And you pay for hosting that VHD file. So it won't be tens of thousands of dollars, but it can be a couple of dollars per month just to hold the data of those virtual machines uh, while they are uh, shut down, okay? So you are actually paying for machines that you're not currently using. It's a minimal fee, but you're still paying for them, and you need to uh, maintain them. Just as I said, you need a new version, you need to install Windows updates, you need to turn on those machines, install the updates on top of them, and then shut them down again, okay? It's a lot of IT work here because you need to maintain all of those servers. So that is why when we look at the solution, we try to think, well, maybe I should try to consider using platform as a service, okay? So platform as a service is similar to virtual machine, the concept that you actually have a virtual machine under that cloud service, okay? The actual machine that is running is a virtual machine. It's not a physical machine. Okay, the machines in Azure that you see are always virtual, they're not physical. But what we have in cloud services is actually uh, um, virtual machines that are created for us when we need them. So basically what we get is a Windows server, it's only Windows, not Linux. It's a Windows server that can either be a web wall or a worker wall. A web wall, the difference between a web wall and a worker wall is basically if it has IIS on top of it or not. Okay? A worker wall is just a simple uh, Windows Server virtual machine that runs your code. It can be an executable, it can be a DLL file, whichever that you upload, um, but basically it just runs your code. A web wall is the same server running IIS, so it hosts your web application, okay? You upload a web application to it, it creates a website for that web application, and starts hosting that web application. It never shuts down, it never restarts, uh, unless, of course, um, the Azure Fabric needs to install an update on top of that machine. Uh, 
In cloud services, the entire management of the operating system is handled for you uh, by Microsoft. So every hotfix that needs to be installed on top of Windows, every security patch that needs to be installed, Microsoft will do it for you automatically. So you don't actually need to, con to physically connect to the machine and install something on top of it. You don't need to do that. How do you actually uh, do install uh, stuff on it? For example, if you want a, a worker role, uh, a role that runs an application to run not a .NET application, which is automatically supported by Windows, but say a Java application. So what do we need to install uh, to run a Java application on top of Windows? We need a JVM, right? So for example, when I'm packaging my application and uploading it to the cloud to be used in a platform as a service, in a cloud service, I can actually attach a script, a startup script, to that package and that startup script will basically download the JVM installation to the machine it is hosted in, install uh, another line to install that uh, um, JVM uh, in the machine, and then start running the application. If everything goes well, it should be able to download, install, and start the application successfully. If something goes bad, the machine will just restart and retry to do the entire steps again. You will be uh, um, noted. Uh, you, will be not, uh, you will be noted if there is a problem starting the machine. You can actually see that in the portal that the machine cannot be started successfully. Okay? So basically, platform as a service, uh, which is called cloud services. Uh, if you are familiar with Windows Azure back in 2010, 2009, it was called once hosted services. So you might see that uh, uh, term uh, popping up in uh, all documentation. Cloud services is basically bring your application package Azure will bring the servers, okay? So I don't need to think about installing IIS. I don't need to think about installing Active Directory. I don't need to think about how to uh, um, create a new version of my application, how to deploy it, because if I need to deploy a new version of my application, basically what I do is I just repackage that zip file, update it in the cloud, and instruct Windows Azure to just uh, uh, re-image all the machines, to just pull that zip file, install it, on every one of my machines again, okay? So when I'm um, <coughs> talking about cloud services, I'm mainly talking about roles, and each role can have multiple instances. So even when I create a web role, I can actually instruct Windows Azure, please create 10 instances of that web role. What will it do? It will create 10 virtual machines that are running uh, Windows Server plus IIS, and it will take that zip file that I uploaded and will deploy it to those entire 10 machines automatically for me. I'm getting a machine already prepared, ready to run. Okay? The only difference between that and a VM is that those machines don't have a persisted hard drive. Okay? And that's uh, one important thing to remember. In virtual machines, you have the data backed up in six different locations in the data center and outside. In cloud services, all the hard drives that you get are transient hard drives, meaning that if uh, one of the instances will crash or uh, needs to be restarted because there is a, a, a patch that is installed on the Windows servers, um, you might get that same instance now running on a different physical machine in the data center. You'll get that same, um, that same instance somewhere else the package zip file will be downloaded to that machine, but all the files that existed on the physical hard drive of that host, uh, hosting server will be gone, okay? Because the data is not stored in blob, it is stored locally on the physical drive of the hosting machine. Um, the Windows Azure uh, cloud has, I don't know, has anyone, has anyone ever seen an image, a photo of a data center? Do you see one? No? Let me show you what a data center looks like. Um, just so we'll see from bottom to top. Um, this is a, um, what should we call it, a container with compute and storage racks. Okay, these are, um, the part of it is uh, compute racks, part of it is storage racks, so you have here terabytes of storage. And this one goes into a data center as a container, they plug it into electricity, cooling, networking, that sort of stuff. And basically, data center looks like so. This is about the size of uh, um, 10 football fields, okay? 
So you have about um, between a quarter of a million to half a million servers inside a data center, which is a lot. Okay. <clears throat> so when we talk about instances, I mean, with half a million servers, something must go wrong at some point, right? You can't have half a million servers running 24-7 without any glitches. So whenever there is a glitch and one of the instances shuts down, your application will automatically start in a new instance somewhere in the data center, but without the original data that you wrote to the disk. So one of the things that you need to remember when you design an application for a cloud service is never write local data that you want to be persisted. If you want, write it to storage, write it to a database. If you're writing, for example, log files, everyone is writing log files to the local drive, right? Uh, there is support for a diagnostic agent that every couple of seconds or minutes you can define that, um, takes the local file and puts it in blob storage. Okay, it's automatically done for you, you just need to configure where is the file and um, uh, the interval, the time interval that uh, um, the agent that will pick the file and put it in storage. Okay? So Microsoft thought of this issue for you and solved that. But don't use it, for example, if you have a website and you're uploading images to the website, don't store that image locally. Store it in a database, store it in Azure Storage, storage somewhere other than your local hard drive. Okay? <clears throat> so how do we um, upload code to cloud services? So basically, we build our code and we package it. As uh, I told you um, a couple of minutes ago, that code doesn't even have to be .NET. It can be anything that is able to run on Windows. Java, .NET, C++, PHP, uh, Node, everything that has a, a, um, a, what is called a VM, like a JVM or some sort of a hosting environment in Windows, you can run it on top of a cloud service. Okay? So you package that application and you just upload it to the cloud and Azure deploys your package into the number of instances that you require. Okay, so if I'm saying I want a worker role which listens, for example, which has an application that listens to a queue, okay, which is basically what we do when, when we want to scale uh, a backend service. We, uh, um, we assign it to listen to a queue and then we send messages to that queue and the more servers we have that listen to a queue, the more scale we can handle, the more load we can handle, okay? So I can ask it, run my application, my uh, a queue listener on top of 10 instances, each one has, uh, for example, four calls, and it will just create those machines and run the application on top of them. Okay, if I want a web server, two web servers, I can have a mix of two web servers and 10 worker roles. Okay, uh, so that is my basic cloud service. If I need, for example, uh, to now to scale my application because I noticed that two web servers are not enough, or uh, even that I have two web servers, the queue is filling up and I need more than 10 uh, instances of my worker role, I can simply tell uh, Windows Azure to create more instances and it will automatically deploy my application to those instances. If I need something installed on those instances, like the JVM, I will simply place a startup script inside my zip file. Of course, I need to make sure that it doesn't take 10 or 20 minutes to download uh, the installation and install it because, for example, if I don't know, if I want to run uh, MATLAB code in that machine and it takes five or ten minutes to install MATLAB, uh, I probably won't want to do it in a cloud service because even if I have a high load, I won't be able to handle that load until those ten minutes pass, and then I will have the machines to handle the load. So, your decision, but we'll talk about that later. Okay, so cloud service is one of the platform as a service options that we have in Windows Azure. The second platform as a service solution we have in Windows Azure is what is called websites. Website is basically uh, similar to a web wall. So it's a virtual machine that runs IIS and you can upload your web application to it. But the difference between website and web wall uh, uh, that website allows you to, uh, um, let's say, website allows you to use them without paying money, okay? Basic bottom line. Uh, one of the reasons why we have website today is because cloud services cost money. The minute you create a virtual machine for a cloud service, even if it has one CPU, you start paying for it. 
Microsoft wanted to give uh, users the ability to upload web applications to a shared server, okay, a server that shares uh, several, uh, several clients on top of that same machine, and they wanted to allow users to start exploring Windows Azure. So they created websites. So website is basically a bunch of virtual machines in the cloud that you don't have access to. You can only upload your web applications to them and start running. So, web uh, so website is basically start simple, it's free. If you need to create a real web application that has thousands and tens of thousands of users, you probably want to scale from the free model to the paid model. Okay, just so you can have a dedicated server instead of a shared server. Once you do that, after you decide uh, uh, which size of server you need, you can just go ahead and deploy your application. Anything that can run on IIS can run in a website. So basically it means that, of course, ASP.NET, but also PHP, Node.js, okay? currently not J2E, but who knows. Uh, everything that runs on IIS can run in a website. And of course, website also gives you good connectivity for um, automatic deployment, continuous integration. Okay, so if you have a source control that supports continuous integration, such as Mercurial, or Git, or Bitbucket, or even, of course, TFS, okay, you can actually connect that source control to your website and have it deploy the latest version automatically to the website. Okay, so website, again, simple web hosting, and the idea here is to have a new website in a matter of seconds. I didn't talk about it, but I will demonstrate it. If you want to create a cloud service, again, cloud service creates virtual machines for you. Cloud service is deployed initially around five to 10 minutes. Okay, website deployed initially in under 10 seconds. We'll test that. Okay. <clears throat> so website scaling starts with a free tier, uh, which is multi-tenant. You get other people using the same servers. Uh, if those people have bad written code and they use the entire CPU, you will fill it uh, uh, quite quickly. So it's good for testing. It even has um, daily quotas. So for example, you can't have more than um, 160 megabytes of downloaded content. If a user starts downloading too much information from your website, it will be stopped. Okay? It will get stopped. So if you want to uh, be able to uh, um, to handle more users, you can move to the shared uh, option, which starts to cost money, but not a lot. Okay, it's about, I think, $10. Uh, we'll see um, at the end of the session, we have the list prices for everything. Uh, so it's still a multi-tenant, but you don't have a quota. You actually pay for what you have, whatever your users use. So even if a user downloads one gigabyte of data from your website, you'll just pay for that one gigabyte download. Okay. Uh, by the way, in Azure, you don't pay for upload. So even if a user uploads 10 gigabytes of data to a data center, uh, you don't pay for that. Only for downloaded data. Okay? If you do want dedicated VMs because you need a CPU, you need to control the VMs, uh, you can just start paying for those calls. They actually cost less than having a web wall. Okay? But the difference between a web wall and a website is that in a web wall, if I need to install, for example, uh, a third party DLL or a tool of some sort that I can run in the background, I can do that using the startup script. In websites, we don't have that option. We get a VM, it has IIS in it, it hosts a web application. If we can't upload it in the package, it won't run. So even if we need, a, I don't know, um, an executable that we start using a, a process.start, from within our code, I can do that in a website, uh, in a web wall, I can't do that in a website, okay? Because I can, can't actually upload that executable. <clears throat> so website, lightweight for web hosting. The fourth option that we have is actually even uh, 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 more specific. It's not an entire website, it's only the service layer of your website. Now, mobile services, I have to admit, is a bad name because people see that name and think that it's for mobile devices. No, okay? Uh, mobile services was initially uh, named like that because the intention was to give 
mobile uh, uh, developers, mobile uh, um, uh, people that create mobile uh, uh, applications, uh, people who want to concentrate on building the user interface, a quick way to build the backend of that application. So for example, if I'm uh, a developer that knows how to develop for iOS or for Android, and I want to develop a backend service for my application to retrieve data from the database, to store data in the database, I need also to learn how to develop server-side code, right? So I need to learn, for example, if I'm a .NET developer, I need to learn how to develop in Web API uh, or WCF. If I'm um, a JavaScript developer, I need to know how to uh, develop using Node, okay? I need to learn another language. So instead of that, Microsoft uh, gave a simple solution. You will tell us which type of entities you need, we'll create the database for you, we'll create the tables, we'll even create <coughs> the basic CRUD logic, the create, read, update, delete logic for your tables and for your entities. All you need to do is download um, the SDK. We have SDK for .NET, we have SDK for iOS, we have SDK for JavaScript, we have SDK for Windows Phone development, okay? We'll give you the SDK and basically uses just simple HTTP calls. If you want to interfere with the code to customize that code, we allow you to do that. You can even uh, um, edit the generated code on the server side if, of course, you want to, to customize it. Of course, then you will need to uh, get familiarized with the technology used on the back end. Okay? So um, up until a month ago, we had only Node.js as the back end uh, platform. Today, we actually have both Node.js and ASP.NET Web API, meaning you can actually, uh, uh, if you know a bit .NET, you can create the backend services in .NET instead of Node.js, okay? So it basically gives you an entire server-side logic, which you can automatically use after five minutes. So it's not only for mobile, even if you're de developing desktop applications and you want to concentrate on developing the desktop <coughs> application and not the backend services, you can still use mobile services. Okay, just for the mobile services, it should be called simple to use server-side HTTP-based services, but that's a long, too long of a name, so they call it just mobile services. So what do we have in mobile services? First of all, we have control over data. I can use a SQL um, um, database, an Azure SQL database from uh, my code, my custom code on the backend. I can even send push notifications to clients. Uh, Windows Azure um, has a feature called um, um, service bus um, hubs, I think it's called, uh, that allows you to send push notifications to devices. So it can send to iOS devices, Google devices, Android-based devices, Windows phone devices. You can actually send push uh, notifications from the server-side code. Of course, you need to write some custom code to do that, but it's quite simple. Uh, it supports authentication. So we have an entire authentication mechanism, including authorization mechanism, so I can decide which user can uh, perform write operations or only read operations, um, and I can customize my service accordingly. <coughs> I can write custom server, log uh, server logic. I can even add my own API to the server if I need something more than a simple create, read, update, and delete. Um, I can set automatic scale because I'm writing the code. I don't have uh, a virtual machine that I actually control. Azure brings the virtual machine that hosts that application, okay? So I can automatically get the scale that I need. If I need 10 machines to run my application, I'll just tell Azure, scale me to 10 machines. Of course, I'll pay more, but I'm already getting the, the ability to auto-scale my code, okay? Um, I have the option to use uh, uh, console logging. I have options to get diagnostic information of how many users are using my services, uh, to do some monitoring. Uh, that's also supported in mobile services, and I can also schedule um, tasks that will run, custom code that will run every couple of hours or every couple of minutes, just if I need, for example, I don't know, to uh, um, go over my database and do some calculations, uh, maintenance work, batch uh, operations on a database. I can also use the same machines to uh, uh, run those tasks based on the schedule that I create, okay? <coughs> So we've seen four different versions, infrastructure as a service with virtual machine and platform as a service with cloud services, websites, and mobile services. 
it's time to actually see how they work. Okay? So let's create a basic hello world with all of those uh, platforms. And this time I will open Visual Studio for that. Okay, so we'll start with the thing that takes the longest, which is cloud services. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what I do is I'll create a new web application. Let me just switch here. Okay, simply call it web application one. And that web application can be any type of web application. An MVC, a web API, it doesn't really matter, web forms, okay? Uh, let's select MVC. For the simplicity, I'll select no authentication currently. And this is a simple web application right now. What I want to do, I want to do two things with it. I want to create uh, a website from it, and I want to host it in a cloud service, okay? So let's try the cloud service first. This is my first platform, the service option. And to create a cloud service in Visual Studio, let me just close the windows. Uh, to create a cloud service definition, uh, I need to create a new project. This is called an, a cloud project. Uh, so I'll add another project to Visual Studio. Um, to get the option of this project, you need to install the Windows Azure SDK on your machines. Okay. If you want to develop uh, uh, for Java or C++, then you can simply do the stuff that I'm doing from command line. There are tools for command line, the tools for PowerShell. You can just run to uh, uh, take your application, package it, and upload it to the cloud. Because basically what I'm doing now is I'm creating a configuration file that knows how to upload my content into Azure. Okay? This uh, project doesn't have any other special things that it does. I will even use it without creating uh, basic applications. I have a web application, I just want to wrap it as a package to upload it to a cloud service. So if you have an existing web application, just add a Windows Azure um, project to your solution, right click roles, add web role project in solution. It will tell me, yeah, you have a web application here, I can host it for you in a cloud service. Click OK, and um, it installs um, two or three uh, assemblies in my web application. Those assemblies will allow me to know that I'm running inside the cloud service, get information about in which role I'm running, uh, which instance uh, number I'm running in. So for example, I can know that I'm in instance number zero or instance number one. I can actually get, for example, the IP of instance number one if I need to communicate with it. Um, and now this role actually defines a couple of stuff. So first of all, I need to define the size of the machine that I'm creating, whether I want a machine with uh, a single core, two core, four core machine, eight core machine, I need to decide the size of that machine. So I'll stick to small. Small is uh, one core, and uh, um, I think it's um, 750 megabytes of memory. And I can also select how many instances I automatically want to create of that machine. I'll stick to one. I'm sticking to uh, lower numbers because I don't have enough cores on my account. Okay? Uh, that's the reason. Um, I can select if I also want to support HTTPS. In that case, the platform as a service will automatically create an SSL certificate for me. I don't even need to be bothered with that option. Um, if I want to enable diagnostics, it's automatically enabled, but if I want to customize it, for example, for a web, web application, we might want to grab all the IIS logs, all the failed request tracing file logs, uh, and put it in blob storage. So I can actually create a custom plan and go, for example, to the log directories and say that I want to uh, grab all the IIS logs and put them in blob storage. Okay? I can specify exactly um, how, <coughs> how frequently I want to do that, uh, how much this quota I want to uh, give to those uh, log files. So for example, over one gigabyte of files, if they were generated too quickly, then just override them because I don't want to copy more than one gigabyte of, of log content to my blob storage. Okay, so I can set those quotas. I can decide uh, um, whether I want to grab all the information from the event viewer, from performance counters, and basically just monitor that server and place all the diagnostic information in blob storage and table storage for me. Okay, so let's stick with errors only. 
Um, I can set stuff, for example, like which endpoints I want to expose to the internet, port 80, port 443 for HTTPS. Uh, if I'm hosting a worker role and I'm opening a service listener, okay, for example, a WCF listener on port 81, then I can simply say, please expose port 81. This will actually configure the Windows Azure firewall for me automatically, and it will automatically configure the Windows firewall inside the operating system to expose those um, IPs. I don't actually need to create a startup script that uh, controls the Windows firewall for that. Okay? Um, I can even add certificates. If you have your own certificate instead of the uh, Azure General Certificate, uh, and basically what I need to do now is just go ahead and deploy this application. So I'll select Publish. <coughs> I need to select my subscription. I already imported the subscription information. And now I'll create a cloud service. Cloud service, basically when I say create a cloud service, I'm assigning a DNS name for this web project. Okay? Um, so I'll select, for example, I don't know, Dev Week. 2014. Okay, it will check because this name is actually a unique name. It's going to be devwick2014.cloudup.net. That's the DNS name of my server, so it has to be globally unique. Um, hopefully, no one used it in any one of the demos. Uh, I can select the region, so let's select no fuel because it's not far from here. Okay, let's see if it's in use. Okay, the cloud service was created. I can actually go now and check if it was created. Let's refresh the window here in the background. Um, I can select even if I want to production and staging. This is something uh, that is very cool in platform as a service. It actually provides you with two environments, one for production and one for staging before you actually deploy your code into production. So you can even test your application in the cloud uh, as you should test it just like you have staging environments on premises. Okay. Um, and I can do stuff like enable remote desktop. Let's tick that. Enable remote desktop actually you can log in from the remote machine. Yeah, and I can even do stuff with it, but take into consideration that if I log into that machine and I change something locally, in 10 minutes, for any given reason, that machine might shut down and a different machine will start up in a different server, meaning all the changes that I did will be gone. So if I need to, if I need, for example, if I'm loading an application and something goes wrong immediately and I need to test uh, locally because I have custom errors turned off and stuff like that, um, uh, I can remotely log to that machine. Um, I can check the event view. I can even change my code locally in that machine, verify that it works, apply that code in my development environment, and then uh, redeploy the application. Okay? But uh, unless something uh, really weird goes on, you will probably have control of that machine for the next couple of hours without having nothing, uh, without having something being changed, okay? Um, because you simply remote desktop in a machine, what's the, what are the ch chances that in those five minutes something will go wrong and the machine will restart, okay? Everything can happen, but usually it won't happen that fast. Um, so I can enable remote desktop. By the way, I can even enable more additional things such as uh, profiling. If you are developing a web application and you want to see uh, how it runs in the cloud services, uh, you can actually run a profiler, a sampling profile or instrumentation profile or Visual Studio and diagnose the application in the cloud service. Okay? Uh, I can even enable remote debugger and debug the machine remotely. Okay? So click next and um, right now there are a couple of things that are done. First of all, the entire application is being packaged that package is uploaded to Windows Azure, and then after it uploads, uh, Windows Azure will create a virtual machine for me and deploy the application to it. If I asked for four instances, it would have created four different instances and deployed the application to all four of them. So while it does that, uh, let's go ahead and create a virtual machine. Okay, so to create a virtual machine, the process is quite simple. Just click New. Um, I can even select from gallery, which is the longer path. Um, I can select different type of operating systems. As you can see, we have a lot of them. Uh, there are many variations here. For example, if I click the Windows Server 
I have both server R2 data center, server essentials, um, server 2012, not the R2, and even Windows Server 2008. So let's select, do you want a Windows Server or do you want a Linux? We can do a Linux. It's not a Microsoft conference. Okay, so let's do Linux. Why not? Let's create an Ubuntu machine. This is an Ubuntu server. Okay, I'll click next. Um, I can even select different release dates. So I have a history of images which were created for that uh, virtual machine. Virtual machine name, so there we go. To this, uh, this Linux distributions, or well, if there is another one which is not on the list, then? Um, you are limited to the distributions you have here. If you have your own distribution, you might be able to uh, just upload it as a VHD to the cloud and, um, and then use that as a machine. Um, it, really, um, it really depends on how that machine uses the network cards and other limitations that you have in Windows Azure. For example, in Windows Azure, virtual machines can, can only have one network uh, interface card. Okay, so you might be limited. Uh, but you can check that, you can just try it out and see if it works or not. Okay, but it might work. Um, so I can decide on the size of the machine. As you can see, we are currently limited to A7, but we'll probably have A8 um, in a couple of uh, uh, weeks. Username, I can upload a certificate or provide a password. Let's provide a password. Okay. Um, the same way that I'm creating a virtual machine, I need to give it a DNS. So that's why a virtual machine is actually hosted inside the cloud service DNS. Uh, it's a bit confusing. Why do I need to create a cloud service, a platform as a service for a virtual machine that is infrastructure as a service? That cloud service is only uh, um, um, here to give a DNS address to the virtual machine and to supply the load balancer. Okay? There is nothing from the platform as a service uh, that you actually use in virtual machines. It just, uh, it just gives you the DNS and the load balancer. Uh, so this is used. Okay? So let's add a VM here. So it should be okay. Um, select again the region, North Europe. Storage account, I need to select one because this is where all the VHD files of my machine uh, will be stored. So use an automatic, um, yeah, an automatic generated. Let's give it that. I can select which ports I want to open. So for example, it automatically gives me SSH so I can remotely connect to the machine, configure. If this was a Windows machine, it would have given me PowerShell and RDP. Okay, um, we'll stick to that and start creating the machine. So the machine is being created. Um, this one is being deployed. This is actually, according to what I see, it already uploaded all the content, and now it's creating the instance. What I can do in the meanwhile, I can also deploy the website. So let's deploy the website. So let's go to websites, and we'll create a new website. So all I need to do is go to the um, quick create, so this website has nothing to do with the cloud you have created? Is no, it's, an, it's the website, it's not a web wall, it's a website uh, um, hosting environment. Okay? So basically I'm not even creating a virtual machine. There's probably already a virtual machine running somewhere, and I'm just joining that virtual machine, and I'm adding a new application to the IIS that is running inside that virtual machine, because I'm currently, the, the basic uh, thing that I'm, I'm creating, let's use the custom one, um, the basic thing that I'm creating here is simply a web application, a free web application. If I will, will switch it to uh, a dedicated server, then I will need to wait for a VM to be created. But currently I'm using the free version, so it will just um, append my web application to an existing VM that is already running. That's why it will take me about seven seconds to create this web application. So let's try that. Dev week 2014. This is a different DNS address. Uh, a suffix so it won't uh, collide with the cloud service. So this is Azure websites and that the other one was cloudapp.net. Um, no fuel, I don't need a database. Um, don't have a source control right now, so let's just create the web application. One, two, three, four, five and a half, six, seven, eight, uh, under 10 seconds, nine, Okay, created, I can even browse to that application now. Um, let's try browsing to it. Okay, so right now it's empty. It won't give me anything. It will probably give me a general, okay. 
uh, general page, this website has been successfully created. Now what I can do is I can actually go back to Visual Studio. My application is still deploying. Um, how many people are familiar with Web Deploy, the Microsoft Web Deploy? Okay. Web Deploy is a tool that you can use to deploy web applications to servers. Uh, on premise, in the cloud, doesn't matter, it works uh, on both platforms. So I can just right click, not the Windows Azure project, but the web application project, publish. Now I can um, create a new profile, uh, uh, um, um, specify exactly the location of the server, but instead of doing that manually, I can actually import it for my subscription. So as you can see, it's already here. Okay, it connected to my Azure subscription, pulled the list of all the available websites, and I can just select the website I want to uh, deploy to. So this is DevWeek 2014. It downloads uh, the configuration of that server, the address where I need to deploy the files, uh, the username and password for the deployment, everything is here. Of course, it was able to do that because I have a certificate uh, that I used to connect to my, uh, um, to my Azure account. Otherwise, you would have been able to do that uh, um, just like I did, because, but you don't have the certificate, only I have the certificate, so I was able to do that. And next, let's deploy the release version, not the debug version, publish. And let's see who finishes first, okay? So <clears throat> we started to create a cloud service about five, six minutes ago. Um, we are creating the web application, we're deploying it to the cloud right now. And by the way, when it's done deploying, it will automatically open um, a browser and browse to that web application. Okay, so this one is still deploying. Uh, I think, it, actually, yeah, it is complete. Okay, but let's see the web publish, if it, and the web publish deployment is done. Let's refresh it. Okay, I'm just refreshing the page. Okay, so it took me about, what, 15, 20 seconds to deploy the web application to a website. The cloud service took about five, six minutes. Um, it also uh, completed a couple of seconds ago, so I can just click that and browse to the web application. <coughs> so we can just, we can navigate to these websites, yeah? Yeah, if you try to browse it from your own laptops, uh, DevWeek 2014 cloud of or devwick2014.azurewebsites.net, you will uh, be able to see those websites, okay? What about if you're using your own domain? Sorry? What about if you're using your own domain? If you're using your own domain name? Yeah. Um, in Azure websites, you can actually configure custom domain names. Okay, if I go to websites, I need to upgrade from the free uh, uh, tier to the standard tier in order to do that, but I can actually go here to configure, um, and I can provide, give it a second, and I can even provide here uh, my own domain name. Okay. Uh, for cloud services, I can't manage the domain names from within the management portal. Um, just go to where you're managing your uh, um, DNS address and add the CNA mapping that maps to the cloud application. Yeah. Okay. Um, but you can add custom domain names uh, to both environments and you can even add custom domain names to virtual machines. By the way, a virtual machine was also created, right? It's a Linux machine, it doesn't take that long to create. Uh, so here is our Linux machine. Um, of course, to connect to it, it's a server, it doesn't have a user interface, so no remote desktop of some sort, but I do have SSH connection. So if I grab this name, right click, open up a window where I have support for SSH. Where is my Git shell? Okay. Um, let's give it a second. Yeah, this. It's a PowerShell, but it runs uh, bash commands. SSH, just zoom in. Uh, SSH. Okay, password. Which user did I use? Um, that's one of the problems with creating a virtual machine. If you didn't write down your username, you're out of luck. Um, let me see, maybe it was, oh, it wasn't this, it was Azure user, sorry. Okay. I didn't change the default username, right? So there's, there's no possibility of uh, enabling any kind of UI interaction 
user interface on a Linux machine. Um, on a Windows server, if I'm installing a Windows server, I can open an RDP port on that Windows server and use RDP just to remotely desktop to that Windows server. If I have PowerShell, I also be able to use uh, um, the PowerShell remote management. So from PowerShell, I can run commands that will actually run on that server. Um, but for Linux machines, they only have the, the shell option. So I'm connected to my Linux machine, I can just run um, um, sudo apt-get um, install all the applications. So I'm not a native uh, Linux developer, so not all the commands, but it's basically a machine, a, a Linux machine in the cloud. Okay. Um, so here is a Linux machine. It doesn't have any IIS or web server currently, but you can install Apache on it and deploy everything to that machine. Okay. So we created a virtual machine. It takes no more than five minutes or so to create a machine, whether it's Windows or Linux. A cloud service takes a bit more because it creates uh, the operating system, it uh, deploys the application to that operating system, it starts the application, you won't be able to connect to that machine until Azure knows that your role is up and running. Okay, if that's a web application, it needs to start IIS and verify the IIS uh, load successfully before it even allows you to browse to that application. In websites, the machine is already there, just deploy your application to it and browse it. Okay, that's it. Now, the last thing I want to show is the option of um, mobile services. So let's create a new mobile service. Again, Dev Week 2014. This has a different DNS, Azure Mobile.net. Let's create a free database. You can also create a new database, a 150 gigabyte database if you need. Um, region, North Europe. Backend, you can select JavaScript or .NET. I'll stick to JavaScript for now. Uh, database name, Dev Week 2014DB. That's okay. Um, I can use an existing server. I already have one. <coughs> okay, so what it does, it simply connects to an existing database server and creates a new database inside that server. Okay, in Windows Azure, we have a database as a service. Uh, I don't actually need to create a virtual machine with a database. Uh, so that will also take a couple of seconds, no more than that. And once it's created, I can actually download um, all the uh, all the clients are client-side libraries I need in order to develop against that mobile service. So it even provides me with an example, uh, with a sample web application I can just grab and start uh, using it and learn from it how to use the SDK. So let's wait a couple of seconds for it to create. Okay, um, the, the amount of time it takes, uh, sometimes it depends on um, how much time it takes to create a database. Creating a database can also take a couple of seconds, so you should take that into account. <coughs> Usually it shouldn't take more than this amount of time, but uh, I'll allow it. We have 20 minutes until the end of the session, so that should be enough. This website also yeah. includes all the uh, mobile-specific services. Is there a subset of, of features of website, or uh, um, how it's related? How, how websites are related to, yes. um, if I'm not mistaken, those mobile services are actually hosted on top of websites. Um, on top, of, okay, so for example, if, if you look at, if you create a mobile service and you look at the address it gives you for deployment, where you should upload your files to, it actually gives you a, a URL that has Azure websites in it. Uh, okay, so if you look closely, you, you'll see that it's actually hosted on top of websites, uh, which is not surprising because they share the, the same, the same uh, uh, features scalability features, deployment features was created, and uh, basically the difference is I, I'm usually, I won't upload something that has to do with user interface to mobile services, just pure services, backend services. Okay, so I have my application here. Um, let's try to create a new HTML application. First thing I need to do is to define the table name. Okay, I'm defining the data set that I'm using. So let's just create, we'll follow the wizard flow, but I can actually do it manually. I have a data tab here when I, where I can just enter the name of the table that I want to create. So instead of to-do item, I can insert employees, products, whichever table name that I want to create. Now, uh, the cool thing about here is I don't need to provide a schema of the database. Once I create a table, a simple table, uh, the schema of the table will change uh, um, um, throughout my development according to what I create in my code. So if I add another property to my employee class, uh, there will be a new column added to the table. 
Okay, if I remove a property, that column will be deleted. Okay, so mobile services is actually um, um, capable of identifying the structure of my entities and add the required columns to the database. So I created a table. Let's download the sample application just so we'll see um, what it looks like. Let's open this, extract this sample. Okay, so what I got here is an HTML uh, application uh, which I can now run it in IS Express. Let's run it in IS Express. It just gives me a, a skeleton of the application just to show me how to use the SDK. I'm not supposed to use this application for development. I'm supposed to check the code, understand how to use the SDK, and just grab the, the keys and the, and the client API and use them in my own application. So let's run it once. <coughs> So right now, I've got a web application running, a sample web application running locally. I can browse to it. Okay, let me open Fiddler. Um, how many people are familiar with Fiddler, the web debugger tool? Okay, um, I'm just opening Fiddler to show you the, the background calls that are being sent to the service as we browse uh, through this application. So this is a sample application running for my computer. But for example, it's loading. It's loading for a long time. Okay. Okay, I have zero items. As you can see, the loading was actually an HTTP GET request sent to the address of devwick 2014 azuremobilenet uh, for tables to do item with a filter of something. Um, if I add, let's just change this to web browser. Um, if I add a new task, okay, let me look at Fiddler and you will see that there is actually a post message sent to the server with the following JSON object, okay? And this is the new item that I want to add to the database. So if I go back to here, let's go to the data tab, I can actually see the to-do item table, click it, and I will actually see that item that I added, okay? This is the item, hello dev week, it's a row in the database. If I want to tweak it, um, edit it, delete it, I'll just use the API that I get here. This is a sample API. I can just look at the code to see how it works. But basically, it's just HTTP calls, um, which are sent with an authorization key uh, that informs uh, um, the mobile service that I'm an approved user. Okay, that's it. Basically, that just so you, uh, just so your mobile services won't be available to all the users that uh, now know your website address. Okay, so you have to provide the key. You can see that, for example, in Fiddler, if I look at the raw message, <coughs> um, you can see that I have a bunch of information here that provides information of my uh, user key. Okay, so I can edit, for example, um, the script. I can go back to my API, uh, not API, sorry. Um, oh, sorry, to the data. Okay, I can go to my script and edit the script for insert, for update, for delete. I can add custom code to, for example, validate the data, um, write to a log file, okay, check permissions. I can write custom data. This is Node.js, so you need to know how to write uh, in Node in JavaScript. Um, but it's basically simple CRUD functions that you can customize. Okay, I can change the permissions. Um, I can add stuff like push notifications, um, identities in the cloud, um, define the scaling, okay? Define the scaling, define the scaling, thank you. Um, and again, we start from free up to a standard which is uh, a machine that I can scale up to, uh, I think it's about, how much, 10? Yeah, 10 instances, um, 10 virtual machines that I can use to scale my application to, okay? So this is basically mobile services, a simple server-side service layer for your front-end applications. Now, we saw a bunch of options, and now the big question that uh, needs to be asked, which to choose, right? Okay, so um, to decide which to choose, we need to compare all of these options. So for example, if you look at basic stuff like deployment time, well, I think that you can all agree that websites was the fastest. 
But usually this is during development. We don't tend uh, uh, to care about deployment time in production because we do it overnight. Okay, so I'm not sure that this is actually a reason why to select websites over cloud services. But if you look at what we can use, so for example, if I'm using a cloud service, I can run any type of application, including, for example, Java, if I want a J2A application. If I'm using um, mobile services, I'm limited to Node.js and Web API. If I'm using websites, I'm only limited to what IIS can support. Um, if I'm using a virtual machine, for example, I'm not limited at all. Even uh, I can even deploy a Linux machine, run PHP code on top of it with an Nginx web server and an AJ proxy load balancer. Okay, any type of thing that I want to do. Um, if I want to connect my server to, for example, to a source control, uh, websites offers the um, the biggest set of connectivity to both TFS, Git, Mercurial, Bitbucket. Uh, um, um, Codeplex, uh, Dropbox, all sorts of connectivity. Cloud service um, offers less options, um, TFS mainly, okay? Uh, if I'm doing it in a VM, well basically you can connect to everything if you know how to do it on your own, okay? So install Git, for example, uh, connect it to a repository and just write scripts that will do Git pull every couple of minutes, okay? Diagnostics, virtual machine, you'll have to do it manually, entirely manually, because you don't have any tool on top of it. Of course, you can use external tools like New Relic or uh, um, RightScale to um, diagnose your servers, uh, connect it to a system center VM, okay? But you won't be able to pull everything, uh, any, anything automatically from those machines. Cloud services, on the other hand, gives you the Windows Azure Diagnostics Agent, which just grabs the information, your event viewer, your performance counters, all the diagnostic data from the machine and puts it in a centralized storage environment where you can just diagnose it later. Okay, there are even tools that show you graphical uh, uh, views of that data, including dashboards, graphs for the performance counters of all the servers, um, very cool tools. Uh, Windows Azure websites, you can grab the IIS logs from them, for the quest tracing, you can even um, grab uh, memory dumps from those servers. Um, the place where you have the least control over diagnostics is mobile services, where basically you can see how many users are using your application and see the, uh, the console log where you can write log messages, okay? You can't actually write log files inside your code uh, because you don't have the option to, sell, to, to store um, any, any content locally on those machines when you're running a mobile service, okay? You don't have that option. <coughs> Let me just close this one. If you look at networking, for example, in virtual machines, I can basically make that entire virtual network part of my own network. So it's just like using virtual machines in your enterprise network. I can even create a VPN to connect to it. And basically, by the way, the same VNet options that I have for virtual machines, I actually have them for cloud services. Okay, inside the cloud service configuration, I can specify that cloud, that, that specific cloud service is part of an existing virtual network, and I can actually get access to my cloud service for my on-premises environment. I can connect, for example, a cloud service to a SQL Server virtual machine that I created without opening any public internet port for that SQL Server machine. A cloud service and the virtual machine can be in the same virtual network. They can uh, coexist in the same network and I can actually connect between uh, one and the other, okay? Uh, websites and mobile services, currently there is no option to connect behind the Windows Azure Firewall. I can't connect from a mobile service uh, to, or from a, a, a website to a SQL Server virtual machine that I created. I will need to go through the public IP of that, uh, of that virtual machine, uh, meaning that anyone from the internet can actually connect to my SQL Server virtual machine, which sometimes can be a problem. So connecting to other resources, to other Azure resources from a website, from mobile services, requires you to use the uh, public internet, which might pose a problem to some of the people, okay? Um, in regards to ports, 
As you understood, websites, mobile services are basically on top of IIS. They have only HTTP and HTTPS. If I'm creating a cloud service, I can use the worker role and open UDP ports, TCP ports, whichever I want. If I'm using a VM, the sky is the limit. Everything that is supported in, in Windows or in Linux, I can do. Okay? Um, in, um, someone asked about DNS. DNS is configurable all over the place, whether for the portal itself and, um, uh, and or through a DNS hosting environment. Okay? Um, you can go to your DNS registrator and create a new subdomain and map it to an existing cloud service, for example. Okay? You can have custom domain names uh, everywhere you want. Um, if you want to restrict access, okay, as I mentioned before, the VMs, when you open a port to the internet, you can actually specify which IP ranges can access the VM, which IP ranges are denied from accessing the VM. Okay, I can do uh, similar stuff to cloud services, but that will use mainly the Windows Azure Firewall. Okay. For um, websites, um, I can only use the restrictions I have from IIS. If you're familiar with the IP restriction section in IIS, um, just, uh, just like you open IIS on your own machine, go to um, IP restrictions, you can enter ranges of IPs that are allowed to access your application. Okay, so you can do the same in websites. So in regards to that, virtual machine provides currently the best option of uh, um, defending from um, DOS attacks and stuff like that because it can actually block incoming calls uh, even before they reach your computer. Okay. <clears throat> if I look at stuff like persistency, which is important, migrating to Windows Azure, if you have a current solution that you want to migrate to Windows Azure, sometimes it's faster to migrate to a virtual machine because you know you don't need to change anything in your code. Usually when I go to clients, I see that they write files locally to the drive, log files, images, if it's a website that it supports uploads, uh, write all sorts of code of stuff locally. Um, the only thing I can tell them is, well, we'll start from IaaS and we'll do uh, um, virtual machines, and after that's done and you start paying to Microsoft, we'll sit down and we'll design the architecture of your software and we'll switch you to platform as a service because basically it's cheaper. Okay, if you look at the bottom line, for example, for a second, prices, okay, having uh, a virtual machine actually costs more than having the same machine as a platform as a service. Not a whole lot more, but still it costs more than creating a virtual machine using a platform as a service. Okay? Um, with websites, if you just want to try out hosting in Azure, you can create websites, you can create mobile services for free. So if you are in the process of checking out Azure, checking if you can host your applications in, in a website, then that might uh, be proven uh, um, worth your time because you can create a free environment. It's limited, okay? Um, don't use it to check the performance of your application because it's also shared. Just check if you can actually host your application somewhere outside your on-premises environment. You know, that way you can check, for example, if it tries to access any local network resources that you have, uh, a file server, a SQL database server, um, and that way you can know that it can actually be uh, um, hosted in the cloud and then decide if you want to host it in a web role maybe, in a cloud service, or whether you want it in a website and select a shared a tier or even a reserved tier uh, so you can gain the entire CPU uh, for your work instead of sharing it with someone else. Okay. Um, the only problem with um, convincing your managers which solution to pick, by the way, is this part uh, where IT stands on the, on the feet and starts shouting, no, I can't host it on a website because I don't have access to that server. Okay. Um, administration is basically only in virtual machines, because there you have full remote desktop where you can do everything that you need to do on those, on those machines. In cloud services, as you saw, you can actually remote desktop to that machine. Um, how much time do I have? Can I remote to that machine? I have two minutes, so let's remote to that machine. Uh, I can go back to the cloud service. Okay, this one, instances, I have one. Why can't I connect to it? Did I enable remote desktop or not? I, yeah, I thought I did too. Hmm. Oh, it's not this one. This is the VM, sorry, this one. Okay. So this is the cloud service. 
Yeah, I can connect using RDP to a Linux VM, that's for sure. Uh, okay. Caps lock, oh, so, yeah. So that's why they have that message down there. Okay, so this is the virtual machine that was created for the cloud service. It's actually a Windows server. As you can see, I can connect to it. I can, uh, if it, since it's a web wall, I can open IIS here, see exactly how it hosts my code. Uh, I can even see the, um, the drives that it has. Uh, but just remember, any change that I'm doing here by tomorrow morning might be gone. Okay, so I can go ahead and change my application and update the web config to fix the problem, but everything that I update here, I need to update back in my code so it will be deployed again the next time I'm deploying my web, my web application to a cloud service. Okay, so basically there are many, many parameters here and you're probably asking yourself, well, which one should I choose? So the answer is, unfortunately, it depends. Okay, it really depends on what you're trying to do. It really depends on the knowledge that you currently have uh, in your organization. I, I met a group once who wanted uh, to create the environment in the cloud, but the only person who knew how to create those uh, machines and what to install on them uh, has uh, left the company over five years ago. Okay, so we actually, just to create a virtual machine, we spent about two weeks just to understand which applications we need to install on the, on the virtual machine, which IS configuration we need to have on the virtual machine. It would have been basically easier just to start from scratch with platform as a service and say the hell with the rest of the code. Okay. Um, virtual machines are usually what we use to migrate our environments. Just create the same thing that we have locally in the cloud, create a virtual machine. If you really want to use the power of the cloud, the auto-scaling, the connectivity to other services, uh, um, the, um, the large use of virtual networks, connectivity to, yes, to virtual machines such as domain controllers and stuff like that, databases. But if you want to have the real power of the cloud, you should aim at platform as a service. So I see, for example, a lot of companies that starts with infrastructure as a service just so they can say, I'm in the cloud, I did my part, this is the POC, the proof of concept, I did it. And now, the next phase is to switch to platform as a service. It's cheaper, the total cost of ownership, the, the TCO, is a lot smaller because I need less IT work on those machines, and I can actually get better scaling, better support, okay? Um, I can even add stuff like, like uh, load balancing between data centers, something called uh, um, traffic manager, that allows me to actually scale my application not in the data center but between data centers, okay? I have a lot of options that are, that are uh, better supported in cloud services than in virtual machine. So yeah, you might want to start with infrastructure as a service just to make it quicker to migrate to the cloud, but the end solution will probably be to m switch your architecture to a platform as a service, okay? And that's uh, what I want you to uh, remember when you leave this room. You can start with infrastructure as a service, there's no problem, that's usually uh, what you do in Amazon. 100% of what you do in Amazon is just uh, creating virtual machines, okay? Um, but at the end of the day, the goal here is platform as a service. And in platform as a service, just pick the type of application you want. You want it just a service backend, mobile services. You want a simple web application, uh, for example, um, I don't know, uh, a catalog web application, or uh, um, some sort of a front end for your shop, then websites. But also to get the real, uh, um, the real abilities of cloud services, the uh, scaling, um, you will probably want to select a worker wall or a web wall, okay? Depending on whether you're hosting a web application or a backend service of some sort, okay? So don't try to put yourself in that AES slot. Start with the minimum, but consider the future. <coughs> and the future is platform as a service. Okay, so, <coughs> so, um, so if you want, um, if how many people here don't have an Azure subscription? Okay, so if you register um, to Windows Azure, 
you get a 30-day trial with $200 worth of resources, meaning that you can create up to, I don't know, um, four machines and have them running 24-7, and that should sum up to about $200. Um, it will require you to give a credit card, but don't worry, it doesn't charge you. It's only to verify that you're a human and not a computer, okay? Uh, because computers don't have credit cards. Um, and, uh, unless they steal the credit cards from humans. Yeah. Maybe it's interesting to note that when you have an MSDN subscription, uh, you'll yeah. get the one If you have MSDN subscription, um, you automatically have uh, the option to create an Azure account and get that $200 or $150, depends on your MSDN subscription. If you have an MSDN subscription, go to subscription.microsoft.com or subscription.msdn.com something, uh, and there's an option to activate your Azure subscription. So you can automatically get an Azure subscription with a $200 per month. Um, it doesn't accumulate. If you don't use it, it's gone. Okay? Uh, and you can start using Azure. If you have two subscriptions, then you can have two Azure accounts, okay? which is cool because each account allows you to create a, a maximum number of calls per month. Um, if you want the um, online training that you can try out in order to learn how to create cloud services, websites, mobile services, all of those options, there are uh, simple walkthroughs um, under Windows Azure Training Kit that GitHub.io, okay, that you can try out. Um, this version, this version of the presentation, if you want to show it to your bosses, uh, it's also available online at this um, uh, link. I think you also got it on your flash drives. And if you want to contact me with any questions that you might have. Um, this is my email below, idof at sellercoil, okay? And don't remember your stickers, okay? So if you have any other questions, um, I'm here. This was my last session for today, so I'm available till the afternoon. Thank you very much for coming, and enjoy Azure.